Mechanics. Free Talk Live. 855-453. That is the SACL toll-free call-in line here on the live Sunday edition of Free Talk Live with Mark. And Stephanie. That's right. It, we are live on a Sunday evening. I know that that just doesn't seem very common, but it is true. You may call in at 855-453-free. Normally we take uh, c- calls on everything, but we're going to be talking to Stefan Kinsella. And Stefan has an unusual pedigree. There's a lot of talk going on around about uh, uh, intellectual property out there. And Stefan Kinsella, uh, Because of the recent SOPA and PIPA thing. That's yeah. right. Stephanie, out there? I'm here, Mark and Stephanie. How you guys doing? <laughs> Very <Hi>. good. <laughs> and you are an intellectual property lawyer. I am a patent attorney and a, a IP lawyer for about 19 years now. So, you know, a lot of people have been uh, talking about the the SOPA thing. As I was watching, uh, I was watching CNN today, and I don't know if these commercials are misplaced. I've heard SOPA was shelved; it's never coming back, and all those sorts of things. But uh, there was a SOPA ad, two of them, as a matter of fact, on CNN today, talking about there are foreign people stealing American products, and um, you know. So this was a pro SOPA. Yes. Wow. So, what do you think about that? Uh, I wouldn't assume that it's dead right now. I think uh, my guess is if it comes back, it'll be under a different name, but it'll just come back under you know a different name. Uh, these two current bills, of course, have different names: SOPA, Stop Online Piracy Act, and PIPA, the Protect Intellectual Property Act. Um, each were, were themselves uh, spawns of one that went down to defeat about a year or two ago called COICA, Combating Online yep. Infringement and Counterfeits Act. Yeah. Um, and there was one passed in 2008 under George W. Bush called Pro IP Act, which actually gave the Justice Department a lot of the powers they have now to stop terrorism. And that is what they used just two days ago to have FBI agents swarm into New Zealand, I kid you not, and arrest four people for copyright infringement in the United States. How do they do it? How do they? I mean, how do they go into sovereign countries with a police force and uh, and sweep people up? Well, they 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 got the permit. They got the cooperation of of our poodles in New Zealand and mm-hmm. Hong Kong and a couple of other countries because you know we're we're the the big dog wagging the tail. But um, it's of course it was literally the FBI doing it. And uh, there's actually another student, a student in Britain, who has been ordered to be extradited to the United States. For having a link on his website, which linked to another site, which had allegedly pirated copyright, copyright uh, allegedly pirated content. So uh, I've heard about that one. Yeah, yeah. The the United States has notoriously always been about the worst country in terms of asserting its laws extraterritorially. That is, in other countries, uh, our antitrust laws, um, our money laundering laws, um, and now our copyright and IP laws. So, um, what do you what what do you say to people? Because um, it's my understanding you're you're against uh, intellectual property. You've written a, a great many, uh, many articles uh, against the idea of intellectual property. What do you say uh, to somebody who says, "Well, they're stealing American products. American companies are coming up with these movies and and the, these uh, songs and and these computer programs, and people that are using them and sharing them, they're stealing." Well, I would say that – I mean this is actually the, the, the problem with the opposition to SOPA and PIPA um, is that most – almost everyone you hear that opposes it says, well, piracy is a big problem, and of course protecting intellectual property is important, but this law just goes too far. And yeah. I think that's why, that's why the law is going to keep coming back because most of the opponents don't have a good reason to oppose it. If you really believe um, – Patterns of information that people release into the world are ownable property, then there is theft going on, and we do need to ratchet up protection. But then we're going to have something like the drug war, where basically you have an un- unwinnable war, yeah. where we just keep ratcheting up the penalties and the prohibitions, and that's what they're doing. The, the basic copyright law hasn't really changed. It's just that they're escalating the enforcement mechanisms and the penalties. The penalties. Um, yeah, to just try to – I mean – there's a study done by one law professor, John Tehranian, and he said, you know, if you take the average internet savvy person, just looking at the activities they engage in on a daily, weekly, annual basis, 
was, you know, forwarding emails, sharing things online. They racked up potentially up to $4.5 billion of liability per person per year. Every one of us, if, if all the copyright law was applied as it's written. So, wow. Unbelievable. And that probably has a lot to do with news stories and things like that because, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I post news stories all over the We the read place. them on Free Talk Live. I yeah. suppose that's technically illegal. I think it might be fair use. I don't know. I mean, I'm not 100% certain. Well, the problem is, so this guy discounted fair use as a big defense because fair use is notoriously vague and ambiguous. It is vague, so, yeah. And it, it results in the chilling of speech when these companies sue you and they say, look, you have to stop this, even if it's a fair use defense. And, of course, that's part of the problem with SOPA and PIPA is that would give – what these laws let – me, let me just explain what they would do. They basically would give the right to the government or even to private companies, uh, depending upon the, the version of the bill you're looking at, to make an allegation that some website had a link a link to infringing content or infringing content, and the allegation could be ex parte. That is, the person who was accused wouldn't even know of this allegation, wouldn't have a chance to defend himself completely without due process. And a process would be put in motion where a, a, an order would come from the government or from a court to Google and ISPs saying, you have to shut this website off. So you would have a website up one day, and all of a sudden it would be just shut down, and you wouldn't even know why until it was shut down. And that would even include websites that had what they call location information tools. In other words, Google, because Google told you where to go to go to a website with certain content that the government doesn't want you to look at. Um, so basically it's Chinese, literally Chinese-style firewall censorship. They would establish what's called a blacklist of 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 unapproved websites, which everyone would have to comply with and shut down, which is the equivalent of a whitelist. In other words, only approved websites that have approved content that the government wants people to hear have the right to be on the Internet, which is the most important tool of freedom and information in world history, which is why the government and its interests are fighting against it, in my opinion. Well, you know, and I mean, and one thing's clear about uh, SOPA is um, it was, I mean, like it was a terrible, terrible uh, IP Law now, I, you know, I'm uh, against generally against the idea of uh, government enforcement of intellectual property rights or whatever they are uh, myself. But the uh, SOPA itself was it was you know literally would destroy the internet. <laughs> so I mean, when uh, what's the guy from from Wikipedia? He got Jimmy on, Wales. Yeah, Jimmy yeah. Wales got on, and I think it was on CNN or something, being um, you know saying that essentially Pirate Bay were a bunch of criminals. You know, yeah, I mean, they I said it was poorly worded on their website too. I think when they did the blackout, I think it said like we can't support this poorly worded legislation, implying that maybe they would yeah, support right. another version or something. And you know, it's it. This is how they do it, though. They 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 bring forth big ugly legislation, and then they'll get some of the provisions that they wanted to get through, or they'll just chop it up piecemeal and put all the provisions into must pass, you know, spending yeah. bills and things like that. Which is why I'm really concerned about this because I think it's not really completely gone. Well, there's al there's already an alternative bill pending. It's called the Open Act, and everyone is breathing a sigh of relief, like, oh, thank God. The more reasonable guys like Ron Wyden are promoting Open, which will be a more reasonable response to piracy. Well, if we have a system where we're already extraditing students from Britain, and we just arrested with our FBI four people in New Zealand, and everyone is already liable to $4.5 billion a year in damages – I think that the tools are in place already to defend copyright. Right. If if you're really yeah. if you're really concerned about it, I think it, it's probably being over defended already. I I mean, what's the next thing? Beheadings in a public square? I mean, literally, these guys are insane. And copyright has this criminal aspect. That's why they're arresting these guys. They're calling it um, uh, racketeering and mail fraud and money laundering just because they had <laughs> they allowed people to share. Now, if you understand what Mega Upload did, and I never used it. But they're not that dissimilar to the way YouTube, which is a Google mm -hmm. subsidiary, mm -hmm. and um, uh, this file sharing site that everyone uses. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it now. You know, people can share big files with each other. It's, it's almost the same idea. So Dropbox and, and those kind of things. Yeah, Dropbox. Dropbox exactly. I, I want to ask Stefan when we get back. It seems like what happened to Mega Upload was really similar to what SOPA allowed, and it happened anyway without it passing. Stefan, please hold the line. 855 450 free if you've got any questions on intellectual property. Stefan can answer them for you. 855 450 3733. 
People ask me, Tim, why did you start VerbalSurgery.com? Well, it's easy. I started making these podcasts to make you feel better right now. That's right. From the tops of the Himalayas to the bottom of the deepest seas. That's right. These broadcasts go out to everywhere on the planet and most importantly, deep inside of your brain to make you feel better right now. And isn't that what it's all about? VerbalSurgery.com. Check it out today. Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call in line here on the live Sunday edition of Free Talk Live with Mark. And Stephanie. We've also got uh, Stephan Kinsella, IP attorney on the uh, line here, patent attorney. But before we get to ba- back to him, do you not have enough time to read books anymore? Audiobooks are a great way to get in all that reading that you want to do without carving time out of your day to sit down with a book. Audible.com is the leading provider of premium digital spoken audio information and entertainment. They've got business, classics, fiction, erotica, history, science fiction, and everything else. Every other book category you can imagine, they've got it at audible.com. It's fast, easy, and affordable. I've downloaded stuff over there. If I can do it, you can do it. I listen to audiobooks all the time and have uh, Audible, Audible's made it easy to do the downloading for me. You can uh, get a free download from Audible by going to audiblepodcast.com slash FTL. That's right. Free audiobook from Audible at audiblepodcast.com slash FTL. Go over there. Check them out. Get one of the books. There's more than 100,000 titles over there, all the uh, new releases and things that you want to read about. Audiblepodcast.com slash FTL. Let's go back to Stefan. Stefan, you there? I'm here. So we were talking about uh, Pippa and Sopa, which may have uh, may have died an ignominious death, but they're trotting out something new called Open? Well, that was proposed by Ron Wyden, um, uh, I don't know, a month or two ago as, okay. a, as an alternative. But it, it's pretty bad as well. Um, it has a lot of the same – it doesn't have the DNS breaking provisions, which uh, uh, which even SOPA has apparently dropped for now. But, you know, the problem with these things are – let me give you a little history of what happened here. We get, In the late 1990s, under the Clinton administration, we had the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Min- Copyright Act. Yeah. And that was yet another attempt to stop the growing threat of piracy. This is the dawn of the Internet. Uh, And then under Bush, uh, I mentioned the Pro-IP Act, which also expanded the powers. So they're always trying to ratchet up their attempts to stop what they call piracy and counterfeiting, which normal people call copying and file sharing and learning and competition. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, under the DMCA, and I was a a new practicing lawyer at the time, and we had to learn these new provisions, and what happened was, um, it had terrible provisions in there. They had these provisions that banned uh, anti-circumvention technology. In other words, if some copyright holder adopts a technological measure to try to protect their copyrighted work, like a DRM provision or something, then if you try to crack that, okay, or you try to, to make or sell a machine that had the capability of cracking that, it was basically, in a sense, to own or sell that device. Now, we all know what these are called. They're called computers. I mean, because every every computer now, even an iPhone, probably could be programmed to hack and decrypt these files. So lying in that provision is the ability of the state to declare illegal every computer on the earth because it potentially could be used to get around – am I still on? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah sorry. You, you know, you see you see how these things can really be used selectively, you know, because if everyone is a violator, then who are they going to go after first? Well, it's the ones that get on the bad side of whatever officials are prosecuting these things. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that, that's the danger of this. I mean, it's like saying every gun, every gun could be used for a crime. So guns are outlawed. It's, it's the same idea behind that as well. Mm. Um, and But in the DMCA, some of the. Uh, people that were a little nervous about it, they didn't really realize what was going to happen. They insisted that we put in this um, safe harbor provision, which said, look, if you are a website or an ISP, really, ISP is what they talk about, internet service providers or online service providers, 
If you have users like that log on and they post material like a comment on a blog or something like that, should the website that hosts it be liable for potential copyright infringement liability if that if the material is copyright infringing or defamation liability, which in my view defamation is yet another type of intellectual property right. And the law said, look, you're not a publisher. In other words, you're not you're not the one responsible for it if your user puts it on your website as long as you timely respond to takedown notices. This is why we have this DMCA takedown procedure that everyone is used to now. But if we hadn't had that in place, it would have probably not allowed YouTube or Facebook or Twitter to ever even arise because they would be killed by lawsuits. And that's why the RIAA and the MPAA have been fighting the safe harbor provision ever since the beginning. And even though it's the one thing that allowed the Internet to thrive, Thank God. And now with SOPA and PIPA, even if you take out these um, uh, the, the provisions everyone says are the bad parts, you still would basically override the safe harbor of, uh, of, of, of the DMCA by basically removing due process and changing the burden of proof. If you just make an allegation, then the site can be taken down. Now, Stefan, um, we're going to take some calls here. We've got uh, Chris in California calling in. Chris, you're on Free Talk Live with Stefan Kinsella. What's on your mind? Hey, um, I was just doing some thinking um, about the whole intellectual property rights issue. It's actually been something I've been thinking about for a while. It seems to me, and I was just wondering if I can get your guys' opinion upon it, um, that the 14th Amendment about equal protection, it seems to me that a law shouldn't be made unless the government um, or the people uh, could ensure equal protection under that law. Yeah, I think intuitively everybody knows that this is, you know, so that corporations can go after, you know, little people, regular people, you know, for, you know, so-called infringements. But, you know, I don't think the government, according to the Constitution, has the right to even make a law unless they can ensure equal protection under it. You know, if I've, if I've got a guff with Sony or a bit with Sony, you know, the government should be able to use all of its resources in order to give me the same you know, protections as it would for a corporation. Thanks for the call, Chris. Stefan? I think that's not a bad point. What Stephanie mentioned earlier about selective enforcement of laws um, is what results from these very broad grants that are only enforced at the discretion of prosecutors against, you know, unsavory characters. I mean, they're not going to go after Google. They could, but they're too popular, so they're going to go after mega uploads. Mega uploads. Of which there are, uh, you know, a hundred other sites out there that do the same thing that Mega Uploads right. does, but for some reason they go after after them. And every once in a while they'll go after some mom whose kid has downloaded some stuff on the uh, uh, on the internet. And these awards that they give are incredible. You're talking about, well, you know, three hundred thousand dollars for sixteen downloads. I mean, I don't know what the math is on that, but twenty thousand dollars a crazy. song. Maybe they're overcharging. <laughs> I actually think there's there's two pretty good cost- – and by the way, I do believe that if SOPA and PIPA had been enacted, they, they very likely could have been uh, overturned as unconstitutional after four or five years of, of police state terrorism of people. Sure, but we would time, get acclimated at that point. Hmm. It's pretty clear it's, it's against the First Amendment. And I would even argue this. There are two really good arguments, constitutional arguments, against copyright law as it cur- currently exists. Number one is the First Amendment. Number two is the Eighth Amendment. The, uh, the Eighth Amendment bans un, uh, uh, unusual and uh, c- uh, excessive fines and unusual punishments. Mm. And you could argue that $4.5 billion a year of liability or these, these fines people get violates the Eighth Amendment, which was passed after the, the Constitution and the Copyright Clause. Interesting. Yeah, and then, of course, absolutely. the First Amendment, which has free speech, it's clear that the that copyright law infringes free speech. And therefore, the First Amendment and Step the and hold Amendment. the line, oh, if you would. Please sure. hold the line. 855-450-3733. Free Talk Live. Are you looking for camping, hunting, or shooting gear? ManVentureOutpost.com carries knives, ammunition, scopes, binoculars, laser sights, fish finders, and boating equipment from manufacturers like Aimpoint, Bushnell, Otterbox, Crimson Trace, K-Bar, Remington, Streamlight, Winchester, and more. ManVentureOutpost.com. Family owned and members of the Better Business Bureau. Prices so low, some can't be advertised. Get an additional 5% off with coupon code FTL. Get it quick. Get it from ManVentureOutpost.com.
Free Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call-in line. You can call in and talk to Stefan Kinsella about uh, intellectual property questions, uh, whether it's uh, SOPA, PIPA, or uh, whatever it has to do with uh, intellectual property. He's here to answer your questions. You know that cigarettes aren't good for you. Uh, you know that they shorten lives. You've probably been thinking about giving the e-cigarette a try if you're a smoker. It's a healthier option. 22,000 times 22, times healthier. Vaporsmiths.com has a great offer. A pack-a-day smoker can save about $120 a month by using an e-cigarette. So you'll already start being richer, feeling better, smelling better. How about... A free starter kit. A free starter kit containing two of the best-made e-cigarettes in the market today, among the best-made e-cigarettes in the market today, is all you have to do is purchase 40 cartomizers with coupon code FTL. It's FTLs and Free Talk Live. Go to Vaporsmiths.com, purchase the 40 cartomizers, use the coupon code FTL, and uh, you'll get free shipping and a free starter kit. You can also call 855-2-GET-VAPOR or Vaporsmiths.com, 855-2-GET-VAPOR, Vaporsmiths.com. So let's go back to Stefan. Yes, uh, Stefan, I have a question for you. Um, in light of the mega upload case that we have discussed on Free Talk Live this week, as well as a little bit with you here tonight, I'm just wondering how, you know, if SOPA and PIPA were to pass, it, it, it said that they would allow things like this to happen and, you know, these more severe prosecutions of so-called violators. But it seems like the government is already doing these things anyway without SOPA and PIPA being law. So I guess my question is, you know, how would it be any different if they passed, if they're already going to do this stuff? I mean, in a way, that's a good question. How much worse can it get already? I, I mean, I think it's just a continual ratcheting up of the government's, um, you know, the, the tools in their toolbox that they can use against people. Um, and, and, you know, to be clear, some of some of the some of the people, um, one of the best sites discussing this is TechDirt, T-E-C-H-D-R-T dot com, TechDirt. Mm. And there was a post on there, I think, by Glenn Moody the other day. Uh, the main poster is uh, Mike Masnick, but Glenn, Glenn Moody had a post saying, okay, we kind of won this temporary battle. What, what do we do now? Let's think big. And, you know, what do we say is the real problem? And let's get to what Mark was originally driving at. The fundamental problem is, is copyright. It really is copyright. Um, this is all basically an attempt to enforce copyright. It's just like the drug war. If you start with the assumption that drugs – Certain pro- prohibited narcotics should not be allowed to be used or sold by by individual free human beings. Then, then you get the drug war. And if you start with the assumption that people own patterns of information and they should have a government monopolistic privilege that they can use to stop their pe- people from trading and sharing and copying and competing, and they can use the state the force of the state against their competitors. Then you're going to get these these types of enforcement issues. The fundamental problem is copyright, and basically, if we want to think big. The solution is not to ratchet up the enforcement of this, not even to think of piracy as a problem, but to try to uh, re- eliminate or radically scale back copyright. Yeah, um, Stefan, that's so. Sure, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's you know that's so interesting that you say that, and I really like the parallel that you've drawn to the drug war. Now, I wanted to mention this to you real quick. I have this article here from Gizmodo.com came out recently, uh, saying that the Supreme Court has uh, approved something that allows recopywriting public works that were previously yeah. in the public domain. Can you talk a little bit about that? So in a way, last Wednesday, and, I mean, in my view, I mean, we'll see. We're only a couple of days away from it. But it, I, in, a, in a way, I think last Wednesday was one of the most historic days possibly in world history because the Internet is one of the most important tools in, in world history to fight yep. the state. And, yep. Okay. Uh, as Cory Doctorow pointed out in a recent um, talk, um, you know, every time technology improves, it, it benefits the state. But it benefits the people more because the state's already in control. So, it, you know, they're already in control of things. But if, if the Internet has empowered the average person with video cameras and cell phones and with, the, you know, Twitter and email and texting and the Internet and social media, far more than it has the government. So it's disproportionate. So it's a good thing. And that's why the state's um, um, fighting against it. 
So well, most of the know, uh, most of the state and the stuff they do on the internet is still Web point one point oh. I mean, they haven't <laughs> they right. they really haven't even moved into yeah. The, they were talking the 20th, about policing. Uh, 21st century. They were talking about policing MySpace. We read this article last right. week to make sure there are no terrorists on there. <laughs> Does anyone use it? Looking yeah, for bands, let alone I guess. terrorists. <laughs> Yeah, and like I said, the the the, the, uh, the pro IP act that George Bush signed um, was 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 uh, you know put out there in the name of stopping terrorism because they said you know terrorists are funded by counterfeited uh, by counterfeited goods and by, um, uh, by by software piracy. I didn't really realize Al Qaeda was really the one hawking Madonna videos. That's right. Wow. Or, uh, whatever. But I think that to be honest, the solution is very simple. The solution – piracy, I believe, is actually not a bad thing. I used to believe it was a bad thing, but that it, it shouldn't be illegal like abortion or something like that. But now I don't even think it's a bad thing. There's nothing wrong with sharing information. The reason there's piracy is because we have these dinosaurs in the media, the big content industries, that don't provide a good product for a good price. I mean, right. if you just – Louis C.K., who's a, a fairly mid-level, well-known comedian, he – has this annual show he does, and he, about uh, two months ago, built a website, and he put his show online, and he said, you can buy this DRM-free thing for $5 from PayPal. No limitations whatsoever. I know there's going to be priority copies, but if you want to buy it from here, here. He made a million dollars in about two weeks, Mm. which was four times more than he even aimed at making, because it was easy and free and a reasonable price. Yeah, uh, and that's what Hollywood has to do. Hollywood and the music industry are really going to be the, the destroyers of civilization if they are if they're able to get uh, Congress to go along with them. Uh, but luckily for now, it looks like they're running scared. You know, if if a band and this has been done by other bands, but if a band just puts their music online and they don't go through the big record label, I mean, these guys have studios in their home; they can produce the music. Then they, you know, it's no problem to put it online. Yeah. I think that with a little help from uh, you know people around me, I could probably put a song online. <laughs> um, you know, so at that point, people can download it, and if you're charging a buck or 50 cents a song or whatever, they're going to make so much more than that dollar per album that they maybe get from the uh, from the record company. That's that's the guys who have been around for a while because most of the money goes into the infrastructure of the record company, paying the, mm-hmm. the, the reps who are hassling the DJs and doing all the stuff that's or maybe uh, Mark, done. Or maybe, Mark, you give away that song for free and then you get hired as a DJ at different parties or something like that, or people pay you to do voiceovers or be on their songs or whatever. Indeed. Stephen? Yeah, and this whole infrastructure has been built on the entire copyright um, legislative infrastructure. It, it might not have existed the same way absent that. But the point is, so everyone says, well, since 15 years ago, since the Internet, it's easier to copy. It's, that's true. It's easier to copy, but it's also easier for people to branch out and to make it on their own without going through a, a, a producer or a publisher. I mean, look at the Kindle and Amazon and uh, iTunes. You can sell your yep. music on your own. You can have a website. You, you can, can have ebooks. And the ebooks yeah. that are prospering are ninety nine cents to two two dollars and fifty cents. Mm-hmm. You're not talking about a paperback coming for eight ninety five anymore. You're talking about people being able to get the same thing essentially on their Kindle for ninety nine cents to two dollars and fifty cents. And it's not going to the book companies. It's going to the author because no one ever says. Whenever you talk to anybody about intellectual property and copyright and these things, they never say, "Well, what about the big music companies? What about right, the right. what about the the, right. the big?" Publishing companies. Who haven't changed any of their business money? practices for the past, you know, 40, 50 years. Like, they, they're just dinosaurs. Yeah, business practices always change. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, there's no more blacksmiths out there shoeing horses anymore. Right, and, and right, and the buggy whip manufacturers out of business, and the candle makers don't do as well as they used to. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's change happens, and the dinosaurs that have government monopoly privileges don't like it. Stefan, please hold the line here. Um, we'll be... 855-450-3733. It's Free Talk Live with Stephanie and Mark. 855-450-3733. Hi, I'm Mark 
Craighead, founder of Crossbreed Holsters. Are you looking for a concealed carry holster? Crossbreed Holsters is the home of the world-famous Super Tuck, the most comfortable concealed carry holster on the market today. Try one out and see how truly discreet and comfortable carrying concealed can be. And find out why we call it the ugliest holster you'll ever love. We are the standard others try to imitate. Get the original. Get your Super Tuck at CrossbreedHolsters.com. Again, that's CrossbreedHolsters.com. Free Talk Live, 855-450-FREE. That is the SACL toll-free call in line, 855-450-3733. It's Mark with you. And Stephanie. Stephanie, tell me about the uh, the Liberty Forum coming up in New Hampshire. Okay, well, first of all, I hope our guest who's on the line, Stephan Kinsella, would consider joining us at the Liberty Forum. Let's bring him on. <laughs> <laughs> I hope Stephan would consider attending the New Hampshire Liberty Forum, which is a annual event uh, held. It's kind of a Free State Project event. It's from the Free State Project. It's going to be this February 23rd to the 26th, so that's exactly in one month coming up. And it's a basically a Liberty Convention at a hotel in Nashua, New Hampshire. It's got speakers. It's got all kinds of... Uh, Breakout sessions. I heard there's going to be an unconference there, which is pretty cool to me. Mm-hmm. Um, some of the speakers that are coming include, uh, let's see, Carlos Miller. Photography is not a crime. Uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, you know, videotaping the police. We've got Peter Schiff, um, Jody Emery, Michael Cloud, Jack Spierko from the Survival Podcast. So very diverse. Um, and oh, the keynote speaker is Joel Salatin, uh, who talks about entrepreneurship and farming, yep. which should be really interesting. So there's a very diverse array of speakers coming to the Liberty Forum. But for so where me, do people uh, go, go to get registered? Uh, well, they can go to freestateproject.org slash Liberty Forum. And I uh, just want to add for me, my favorite part is the uh, the socializing that goes on there. Free state, uh, freestateproject.org slash Liberty Forum. And then coupon code FTL, FTL 2012, 2012 to get uh, 10% off. Stephen, Better get your tickets quick because it's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Stefan, are you on with us? I'm here. I've been trying to get up to New Hampshire for a couple of years now, um, and one of these uh, years, I hope to be there. <laughs> I don't great. blame you for not wanting to fly, Stefan. It's not that fun <laughs> yeah, these days. That's part, of, that's part of the problem. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we were talking about uh, intellectual property here, and I think you, you brought up something that we didn't get a chance to really flesh out, and I think it's very important, is you basically said, do away with copyright and or diminish it greatly. And I think that a lot of people probably, um, you know, rear back at that. They, they, they think of people like authors and uh, musicians, right. people who make movies, uh, people who, you know, I, I think drugs are patents, but I suspect you, I know you feel the same and way And most of the patents. people, by the way, who rear back at that also download music and stuff without paying for it. But or read news stories right. and right. things like that for free. They, they do it natural. They do it natural. Look, look, I mean, let's, let's, I, I between patenting copyright, I think copyright is actually worse. Patent acts like a big tax on society, slows down scientific progress, but it's like a big tax. But copyright is much worse. It, it can be a criminal penalty. It can be used for extradition, as we've seen, and it can be used as a, as a way to control freedom of expression on the Internet. And just, just to go back to one thing I didn't get to finish, the, the First Amendment was enacted in 1791, two years after the, the Constitution was was ratified in 1789. The 1789 Constitution had a, a copyright clause which authorized Congress to uh, protect the works of authors, um, which was called science back then, not the, the arts referred to uh, inventions. In any case, you can huh. argue that 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 the uh, um, that that it's clear that the Copyright Act, as enacted now, clearly infringe, uh, infringes free speech and freedom of press rights. I mean, even the Supreme Court acknowledges this, but they try to balance it, which is what most people that favor both try to do. They try to balance these things. That's why they say, well, this is it's important to stop copyright infringement, but this goes too far. So they want to balance free speech rights. Right. With the su- the, the first- suggestion is that uh, the government, that somebody in the government knows what the right balance is. Mm-hmm. And that's well, uh, right. know, very strange. And, it, you know, either it's stealing or it's not stealing. Either the person, the progeny of the person who created the wheel deserve a check every time somebody drives their car or they don't. And so, I mean, you can't have this kind of arbitrary, we'll have it last 99 years in the lifetime of the artist or whatever period of time, you know. 
Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer needs to be um, you need to you need to pay somebody when you sing that, but Silent Night you don't. Um, so I mean, you know, this, none of this makes any sense. Well, and and there's a principle of legislative and constitutional law which says that you know if you have a later enacted statute or constitutional provision, it overrides the earlier one if there's a conflict. That's why, for example. Uh, prohibition was first enacted on the country, and then a later amendment repealed it. I mean, the reason we don't have prohibition now of alcohol is because the, the amendment that declared prohibition illegal came after. And the First Amendment and the Bill of Rights came in 1791, two years after the Constitution. Mm. So to the extent there's a conflict between the Eighth Amendment, which covers uh, excessive fines, and the First Amendment, which guarantees freedom of speech and freedom of expression and freedom of the press, uh, and even freedom of religion, by the way. I mean, this copyright issue even leaks into the church. I mean, you know, the, you have the church recopyrighting missiles. Oh, you mentioned earlier the Supreme Court decision. On the very day, the Wednesday, that we had this massive SOPA protest, which was effective, the Supreme Court ruled that Congress has the power under this copyright clause to take works that were now public domain – and put them back into copyright protection. Yeah, so you unbelievable. Have thousands, tens of thousands of uh, choir and uh, orchestral works that people have been using for a long time, and now they're going to have to stop using them. Uh, the converse of this is just the other day, James Joyce's works um, finally leaked into, the, finally uh, went into the public domain, at least in Europe. And so now all these troops and companies are going to start doing James Joyce plays. And there's nothing wrong with this. But he's a famous guy, right? Mm -hmm. who, who knows what people's works from 60, 70, 80 years ago that were not as big of a guy as James Joyce were lost because no one could reproduce it without permission. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been lost in the time in the tide of time because of copyright. Copyright destroys culture. Locks things up. You know, I absolutely. I have a story about um, exactly what you're talking about. Let me. Uh, I'll tell you about it in a minute. But let me first take Conrad calling from Fargo. Conrad, you're on Free Talk Live with Stephanie, Mark, and uh, Stephen Kinsella. What's on your mind? Yes. Hello. Sorry to uh, change gears, but I've got a topic which I think is rather important here. Um, Go right ahead. You know, while I think the the copyright stuff is important, but there's only one way we're really going to affect this change, and that's if Ron Paul wins. I would say that uh, he would give the best chance. Stefan? Well, Ron Paul has been, and Rand, as far as I understand, have at least been against SOPA and PIPA from the beginning. But um, I don't, I mean, they're, they're constitutionalists, so I'm not sure they're opposed to copyright in principle. And in fact, I've got to say, it somewhat dismayed me that the Ron Paul campaign uh, last week filed a lawsuit um, using uh, uh, defamation law and trademark law against some anonymous protester who, who – someone who filed this fairly racist video on YouTube attacking Gary Johnson allegedly in the name of, the, of Ron Paul. And, uh, and, attack, and it wasn't Gary Johnson. It was uh, the other one, Huntsman. Huntsman, sorry. Yeah, I, I started no, – that's right. That's right. Um, uh, and uh, so – I agree with you, but the problem is Ron Paul would return to the Constitution. The Constitution allows copyright, um, and I would love for Ron Paul to come out strongly against copyright. At least he's against SOPA, which is good, but he should not be suing people to make them uh, – to reveal their identities because they're anonymous on YouTube and exercising their freedom of speech mm -hmm. um, and using trademark and other intellectual property laws to, uh, to stop them. I, I have to assume that was a decision of his campaign that he wasn't really involved in. It, it would seem um, to me like there's a creative solution to that that doesn't involve using the the copyright system or s suing anybody. You know, it, it would seem like they could put out their own video saying, hey, guess what? This guy is not affiliated with our campaign. This isn't true, you know, and, and see it spread. Let's take Conrad here. He, uh, this kind of reminds me of Ron Paul and what he does with earmarks. See, he, he'll use the weapons in the arsenal while at the same time uh, trying to destroy them, right? Just just because you, you know, you know, you understand what I'm trying to say? Oh, yeah. yeah. I understand, but I don't agree you that you can destroy something by using it. I think that uh, Huntsman and Ron Paul both disavowed the video, and that should have been the end of it. I mean, that was enough to say, mm -hmm. look, 
we're not responsible for what other well, people see. The that sad thing evidence. is, is the way that it works on the news is the news plays the video, says that Ron Paul attacked Huntsman. Then they never pl- uh, play a retraction, or if they do play a retraction, they play it, you know, 50 times saying it happened. And then if they have a retraction, it's one time and then they stop doing it again. Mm-hmm. But it's imprinted in people's minds. But so. they can't make. They can't make the news play that retraction again via a lawsuit anyway, so I don't see how the lawsuit solves that problem. You know, maybe the lawsuit causes another news story. I don't know. The the you know the thing about the Constitution is the, the the copyright clause says that the purpose of this power given to Congress to give monopolies for a limited time to creators of artistic works is to create to encourage the creation of artistic works or science is what they called it back then and there's no evidence that it actually does especially with sopa especially with taking words back into let's the ta- private thing let's talk about that in, in, in a minute here uh please hold the line 855-450-3733 free talk live with stefan kinsella a patent attorney who wants to get rid of copyright law 855-450-3733 free talk live If you want to move to the free state and you're looking for some real estate, well, I know a guy who's really great. It's the Porcupine Realtor. Do you want a home with 20 acres, a lakeside cabin, any takers for renters, buyers, and sellers too? Mark Warden is the guy for you. PorcupineRealtor.com. 8345. Eight five five four five zero three seven three three. It's Free Talk Live's Live Sunday edition with Mark and Stephanie. It's eight fifty five four fifty free. You can call in, and talk about whatever you want to talk about. We've been talking uh, with St- Stefan Kinsella here. Let's bring Stefan back on the line. Stefan, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm here. Great. Uh, we've been talking to Stefan Kinsella about all things intellectual property. Stefan is a patent attorney who believes that uh, that copyright should be done away with. Is that correct? I do. Yes. So um, now, Stephanie, you had uh, something that you found during the break. Yeah, Stefan, I wanted to share this with you. Uh, I just noticed an article uh, related to the takedown of Mega Upload with the, you know, scary raids and people being arrested and denied bail and all that kind of thing. And so apparently there are two other websites, FileSonic and Uploaded.to, that have basically shut down, not because they were arrested or raided, but because they're scared. And apparently now if you go to the homepage of uh, FileSonic, you'll be greeted by a message that says, all sharing functionality on FileSonic is now disabled. Our service can only be used to upload and retrieve files that you have uploaded personally and uh, (laughs) no longer available for use at all in the U.S. So This is a perfect example of the chilling effect mm -hmm. that the state action has on free speech and other innocuous activities. And this is totally predictable, and this is terrible. And I guarantee you that right now, Google and YouTube, uh, which is a a Google subsidiary, and Dropbox and other, they're talking to their lawyers right now, are we in trouble? Are we going to be arrested in the middle of the night with with a SWAT raid on our houses? I mean, there were like 76 police that swarmed on this compound in New Zealand, from what I read. I mean... I mean, a hundred, like almost a hundred people, swarmed there, and they arrested these four guys. And there's several others that are in danger. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's very dangerous. It's terrible. That's and, an obvious uh, show it, of force, right? They're really just flexing their muscles. Yeah, I think they are. I, I think and the RIAA, I think the RIAA and the MPAAA, the uh, the Hollywood and the music industries in, in Hollywood, they're probably laughing right now because they're thinking, ah, you know, all these internet geeks think they won a battle on Wednesday. Yeah, we we really don't need this crap. You know, we were just going to try to get a little bit more power, but we don't really need it because we've got these these goons in our pockets. Yeah, you know, Stefan, what strikes me so much about these big 
uh, content. They're not even content producers. They're like publishers, right? Like the RIAA, MPAA, and uh, some big book publishers and things like that. It it really those are just... associations that uh, attempt to represent the intellectual property rights of those uh, of publishers. I would say would be the way to describe them. Okay. Well, I'll just call them the dinosaurs for lack of a better <laughs> word. But you know, it reminds me of. Uh, a person who who is in a relationship and sees the relationship kind of going downhill, breaking down and says, you know, I have a choice. I can either try to force this person to stay, you know, I can abuse them somehow or try to threaten them or give them ultimatums or coerce them somehow. Or, you know, I can try to improve this as a voluntary relationship so that they want to stay. And it really reminds me of the former. They're just using these tactics of coercion rather than trying to court their customers. I, I agree completely. I mean, look, when you when you legitimately buy a DVD or a Blu-ray and you have to sit through five minutes of FBI warnings chastising you. <laughs> Threats uh, in four I mean, different languages. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the product is actually better if you get it illegitimately. So yeah. these guys have no one to blame <laughs> but themselves. They're giving you a worse product for a higher price than you can get for free. Um, you, know, and, and, you know, some libertarians argue, for example, that um, people that pay income tax um, are doing something wrong because they're voluntarily acquiescing and funding the war machine and all this kind of stuff. Now, you could debate about that. I don't think it's a good argument, but you can you can debate that. But the RIAA and the MPAA are funded by the royalties received when we all pay for legitimate content because, you know, the mm-hmm. lobbying industry is funded by Hollywood and the music industry. So you could argue that you have a libertarian obligation to pirate content just so that you're not giving profits to these guys so they can use to, to, to lobby Congress to, to, to make us more into a police state. So there's um, – you know, most people will agree that there's all kinds of problems with uh, patents and copyrights. Uh, uh, trademarks I don't have as much of a problem with, and I, I know that we can, we can discuss that uh, a little later. But a lot of people will say, oh, yeah, there's all kinds of problems with it, but we can just fix it because what we need to do is we need to make it so that, uh, you know, uh, people that – singers, songwriters, uh, you know, uh, movie producers, uh, you know, people that create drugs, you know, all those folks they need to be compensated and if they're not people will just take the stuff they won't uh, they won't uh, you know pay these folks for their work and it'll stifle innovation and that's what the big concern is it's always about stifling innovation right well that's what they say but i mean <laughs> you know the, the assumption is that these laws have ever worked and there's no there's really no empirical evidence if you, if you yeah. look at all the studies even if you're a utilitarian and i'm, I'm not a utilitarian i don't base my principles on that but if you did you would, you would look at the studies, and every study, one after the other, concludes that there is no evidence whatsoever that these laws do anything but become a net drag on society or, or even worse, empower the police state through, um, through idea. I mean, if you think about how these laws originated, back in the, idea, in the time of mercantilism, um, these were basically grants of monopoly privilege to favored people, supplicants of the crown. You know, you would have a monopoly sure. on playing cards in Britain. You didn't invent playing cards. You yeah. just bribed the court, and so you had the, you were the only guy who could make playing cards. And guess what happened? So they they would go to the the crown and say, "Listen, I think I think there's a guy down the road selling unauthorized playing cards." And so they would burst into the into the shop of a competitor, violating uh, privacy law, search and seizure laws, and inspect their goods and see if the cards had the official stamp of approval or whatever. And this is what we see now with copyright enforcement justifying the state surveilling us and seizing our computers and bust- busting into companies to see if they have copyrighted you know, mm. counterfeit goods. Yeah, I, I, I can totally see how it's really never been about protecting the little guy, right, the struggling artist or inventor who's just trying to make it. It's, it's really about protecting the the vested interests. You know, we'll always have somebody who calls in who says, well, I'm a photographer, I'm a singer, I'm a songwriter, um, I do interpretive dance with uh, flaming chainsaws. And they'll, they'll you know, and, and by the way, I do a radio program, right? And So do I. And we give away <laughs> all of our content completely free. You can yes. go back and get five years worth of free talk live you know, uh, at archives.freetalklive.com, we make it so e- – we want you to do that. 
Why? Well, we put advertisements in there, and we assume that we put a few enough advertisements in our podcast that it's not worth it to you to rip the ads out and create your own free talk live show that you can then serve up to other people because you're not so annoyed by those ads. Um, <laughs> Plus, it gets your name out there, and you maybe you get other uh, speaking engagements. Maybe you get invited to things. You get other opportunities. Well happy. Happen, sure. Yeah. You know. uh, voiceover work, and who knows what else. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had a discussion with an author recently, and they they were asking me reasonable questions. How would it work? And, you know, one answer is, like Leonard Reed said in a classic essay a long time ago, I don't know. I mean, if you ask citizens of communist Russia, um, if you told them we should abolish the state, and if they said, well, who's going to make the toothpaste, and how many brands would there be? <laughs> well, the right answer is, I don't know. And, and, and if the answer is, I don't know, does that mean you can't oppose communism? <laughs> I mean, you, you can oppose something even if you know don't know what's going to come. But one of them said, well, what, let, what if I have a novel and what if someone tries to rip it off and they put it on a site? And I, I just said, well, let's just think about it. Most authors don't really make a lot of money right now anyway, partly because they go through the publishing industry. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, let's say you're popular like J.K. Rowling with the Harry Potter books. Let's say she had written the first one or two Harry Potter books, and they were massively popular. And she might have sold some on her site, like Louis C.K. did, or through a publisher, but she might have lost some sales through pirating, although I believe that probably 90% of pirating is not a lost sale because these people wouldn't have bought a copy anyway. Sure. So it's only, incre- it's only increasing your, your fame of the book. Mm-hmm. Well, she could have turned that fame into lots of things in other ways. She couldn't rely upon the state. It's true. Um, uh, uh, Stefan, can you hold on for us for a little while longer? Sure. 855-450-3733. We'll uh, take calls for Stefan. 855-450-3733 on Free Talk Live's Live Sunday edition. Here on Free Talk Live, we've been pretty excited about the Bitcoin. It's a decentralized, free market digital currency. You can learn more about it at weusecoins.com. But if you already have some Bitcoins and you'd like to spend them, you can spend them at SpendBitcoins.com. When you spend Bitcoins on Amazon via SpendBitcoins.com, Free Talk Live gets a cut. Or if you're an Australian trying to figure out how to buy Bitcoins, you can buy them with cash at au.SpendBitcoins.com. Once again, that's SpendBitcoins.com. Free Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call-in line here on the live Sunday edition of Free Talk Live. 855-450-3733. It's Mark with you. And Stephanie. You can uh, call in and talk about whatever you want to talk about. We've been talking with uh, Stefan Kinsella, a uh, patent attorney, about intellectual, all things intellectual property and his, uh, his disdain for them. First, before we get back to Stefan and take some calls... Um, now that the holidays have come and gone, it's time to get serious about your New Year's resolutions. For 2012, resolve to protect your most valuable asset, your family. Daily, we hear about all the crazy things happening around the world. Unemployment, food shortages, natural disasters, inflation, and that's just to name a few of them. For my preparation, I recommend wisefoodstorage.com. WiseFoodStorage.com offers delicious, ready-made meals like cheesy lasagna and savory stroganoff that are packaged for freshness in individual metal mylar pouches that carry a 25-year shelf life. They come in convenient plastic totes. You can stack them up in the garage or or, uh, in the cellar, whatever is convenient for you. You Visit WiseFoodStorage.com today. You can get a free entree sample right there at the top center of the page. Request a free entree sample. They just ask you for shipping address and some information. And they'll ship some, uh, you know, an entree right out to you. Usually they serve four. You can prepare them right in the bag simply by adding water. And you can also use uh, coupon code FTL to get 10% off of any order that you make for a limited time. It's wisefoodstorage.com, coupon code FTL, or call 855-FOODWISE. 855-FOODWISE, wisefoodstorage.com. Let's go get Stefan back on the line here. Stefan, you there? I'm here, guys. Excellent. We've got a call for you. David in Massachusetts. You're on Free Talk Live. What's on your mind? Hey, Mark, Stephanie, and uh, Stefan. Um, 
I've read um, I've read your book um, against IP, and I've also read Rothbard's book. I've only been new to the Liberty Movement for a couple of months, and. David, David hold on just one second. Living. Hold on just one second, David. Uh, since you mentioned the book, uh, Stefan, where where would he be able to? Where would somebody be able to get, be able to get that? He's talking about a, a monograph I wrote uh, about ten years ago called "Against Intellectual Property," and you can find it on uh, c4sif.org. C4, the number four, sif.org, which means Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. Excellent, David. Go on with your question. Thank you. Okay, so you know I, I've. Uh, read and watched some videos and uh, followed the Rothbard way of, of thinking of things in a voluntary society. And I would think that in a voluntary society, arbiters would go around and uh, be involved in protecting people. You know, I, I think in terms of voluntary organizations, professional organizations, like um, Underwriters Laboratory, as far as means of, of helping uh, protect um Content creators uh, and developers, and okay. I was wondering, you know, what what do you think uh, uh, if the in a free world, if, what would IP look like? Yeah, in a free world, what would IP like look like, and would I have the right to Mark just stilled go it down <laughs> these voluntary means and and arbiters to? Um, you know, dissuade theft. I mean, if someone comes along, person A, who legally or lawfully or, or morally, any of those, decides to buy my software, gives it to their buddy, and then they make, uh, they brag about it, you know, how, how would I basically uh, show them that, hey, the fruits okay. of my labor is you're trying to take them away from right. me? Right, right. Well, I, look, I know this is a difficult issue. It, it's been very muddled and confused, and I'll, I'll give you a quick – here's how I look at it. But, because I tried to – I tried for years to justify IP because I'm a patent lawyer. And, in fact, I, maybe I prefer Mark call me a libertarian than a patent lawyer because it's getting to be a, a criticism at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, um, the mistake is that you said theft, okay? You said someone stealing or, or – taking your ideas, but this is what the free market is about. I mean, there's nothing – you're actually not taking some of the ideas. You're copying or emulating people. I mean, when we say we're in favor of the free market, we're in favor of competition. We're in favor yeah. of people emulating what other people do when they see that they're making a profit and trying to make a profit the same way, maybe more efficiently, maybe the same way. Um, and in response, the original guy has to modify what they're doing and try to ever increase – the goods and the values and the services that they're providing to the co consumer. So con competition is a good thing, and it's part of the free market. And that involves learning, observing what other people do. And if you see that they're doing something that works and attracts people, there's nothing wrong from doing that. There was a famous um, uh, late 19th century uh, anarchist named Benjamin Tucker mm -hmm. who said, listen, you know, if you're going to reveal your ideas to the world for some material gain, fame or just because you want to let them out there, then you can't be surprised if people learn from what you say and then in, 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 incorporate that into what they're doing. And if it makes sense, they can add on it or remix or build on it or whatever. I mean, and he, what he said was, if you, don't want, if you don't want people to copy your ideas, you keep it to yourself. Yeah. You know? So you have, you have a choice. You can keep your ideas to yourself or you can make them public. And if you make them public, that means you're transmitting them to other people and they can learn from them. And the fundamental thing is there's a great video I would recommend to anyone sort of confused by this issue um, by Nina Paley called Copying is Not Theft. It's on the site questioncopyright.org. It's one of their – Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that, and, and I reject the idea. I, I, I can't accept that idea. I was there, well, David. I, I know the feeling. Why would you say it's theft? Well, well, I, 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 well, maybe you know, theft isn't the correct word, but, you know, the... the so then copyright is not theft. Is the <laughs> Copying is not it, theft. <laughs> well, it is the fruit of my labor. And, you know, I, I think as the person creating a work, spending my time, um, in essence, I control the scarcity because I control and set up the distribution channels. So, David, you know, I have I, a question for you. I'd, I'd like to ask a question, David. You said that you uh, were learning about Murray Rothbard's theories and stuff, and I know that uh, as an economist who was in the Austrian uh, tradition, I think 
he we could be correct in saying that he believed in subjective value theory instead of the labor theory of value. So that means basically if you dig a hole and fill it back in, you've done a lot of labor, but you don't, you're not entitled to be paid for it or get a lot of work. And I think that applies to things like books. I mean, if you spend uh, 10 years writing a novel and nobody wants to read it, how much is it worth? And uh, people who have different theories of where value comes from would say different things about that. But what do you believe? Well, if I can take a single um, book or a work of software or a song and sell one copy, and that one person as a non-benevolent uh, agent decides to distribute it to everyone for free, I have not been allowed to compete in the market. So, David, am I responsible for paying for some kind of enforcement agency to run around and hassle your potential customers that uh, um, to, that have gotten your uh, your free song or whatever it is? No, but in in, a, in, a, in this you know um, voluntary society, the question is, how would it work? How, how, what what you know? Should I have no means of recourse by trying to sell something? David, sell I want you to the hold coffee. the line. Um, hold the line, if you would. Eight five five four five zero three seven three three. We're gonna. Uh, Stefan, can you uh, can you hang with us for a few? Sure. Great. Eight five five four five zero three seven three three. Free Talk Lives Live Sunday Edition. The state owns the land, but they don't own the water. To be free today, you need a boat, not just any boat, a life yacht. It's a stable catamaran as big as a house that purifies its own water, generates its own power, grows its own food, and has a shallow draft to be able to get a car or SUV ashore. With a life yacht, you could live free of nearly any government intrusion and have a seashore home anywhere in the world. You can be involved for $1,000 and a commitment as little as eight months. EricksonCouncil.com. Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call-in line here on the live Sunday edition of Free Talk Live with Mark and Stephanie. 855-450-3733 for the uh, duration of the show. We've been pretty much talking about all things intellectual property based on, uh, you know, the SOPA. And the Mind pip- fruit. <laughs> <laughs> the SOPA and the PIPA acts uh, apparently getting shelved with, the, uh, with our, our Congress critters there in Washington, D.C., If you're looking for camping, hunting, or shooting gear, Man Venture Outpost carries knives, ammunition, scopes, binoculars, laser sights, tactical flashlights, fish finders, and boating equipment. Everything that the outdoor enthusiast might want to have, they've got it. And they've got some of the best rates on the Internet. I've got a good friend of mine who's uh, very into uh, all things outdoors, and he checked out uh, ManVentureOutpost.com, and he he independently told me, those are some great prices. You can get an additional 5% off with coupon code FTL at manventureoutpost.com. So you can get the already low prices a little lower. It's coupon code FTL, manventureoutpost.com. They're members in good standing, the Better Business Bureau, and um, you'll be very happy when you shop with them. And anyone can go there, not just men, right? That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Anyone who wants camping stuff. Indeed. Anyone who wants to go on a man venture. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know if I want to go on one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Let's get back. Uh, we, we we had uh, Stefan Kinsella. Stefan, the uh, libertarian um, IP lawyer. Is, is that, we like that better? Yeah, that's okay. okay. Look, uh, the, the, call, the caller had a good point. Let me bring David right um, back on. He's, he's still here. Sure. David? I am. Hey, hi. So David mentioned this fruits of your labor idea, but the way the free market should work, in my view, is that the, we have a, a legal system which respects property rights in – things that are scarce, and you're given that, and then you can figure out a way to make a profit off of it. But the idea that property rights come from labor is actually kind of a Marxian idea that we have a right to things we labor on. You know, in physics, there's the notion of work. And work, if you lean against the wall and you push really hard for an hour, you might sweat. But if you don't move it, you haven't performed any work, right? Because you have to move a force through a distance in the physics notion. And in the real world, if you labor for years on a thong or something else and no one wants to buy it, then, you know, it's labor, but you're not entitled to a return on it. Um, The the way it works, in my my view, is this. We acquire 
ownership of scarce resources. These are things in the world that can only be used by one person at a time, like land or metal objects in the world. And you can acquire that by becoming the first person to own it, that is the homesteader. Or uh, you can buy it from someone else. Of first right. Use, right. Yes. right, but but you have to understand that laboring on something doesn't actually give you new rights. All it does at most is transform things that you own into a more valuable configuration. So if you own something like marble or metal and you labor on it to turn the metal into a sword, you know, that sword is more valuable to you. You've, you've, you've created wealth, but you don't have a new property right. So creation right. by itself doesn't create property rights. It only transforms already owned things into more valuable shapes. Or so not even necessarily more valuable. I mean, couldn't you labor on something and make it less valuable? <laughs> exactly. It, it could be a loss or it could be a wash or whatever. But the, but the point is that you cannot say it's a principle of free markets that whatever you labor on or create, you own. And therefore, I have created a new idea and therefore I own it. That is a central mistake, I believe, that leads people to think that we own ideas because we create them. Ideas are what we use to guide our actions. We use them to decide what to do. But what we do, what we perform as actions, is to employ these scarce resources. So you don't you own the resources, but you don't own the ideas that guide your action. Well, we treat this like a property or an invention, and what we really do under current law is protect the embodiment of the idea. Uh, and what I, yeah. I guess I'm going to put this in NVC speak, just to just the you know, but uh, I feel this need for safety and security. But I'm feeling uh, I'm being aggressed upon, and I I want to know what to do. Okay, if if person A who would normally be a, a legitimate buyer and who admittedly decides to defraud me, and I see it as fraud, I feel like I'm being aggressed against when they do not allow me to sell any other copies in the market by giving it all away for free. How can well, I compete I think- in a free market way if uh, someone has aggressed upon me? And without government, I think there needs to be another better way to handle this. Well, I, I break break down your comments into a couple of things. Number one, you're you're just saying they're aggressing against you, but they're actually not aggressing because they're 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 just repeating your ideas for free, right? That's not aggression because they don't actually invade the the borders of your property. But then you said, how can I compete? That's the real question. But that is the question any entrepreneur in the free market faces. I mean, let's say you come up with a new model for a grocery store. Let's say we're, we're 30 years ago and you have a grocery store chain. And you realize, hey, if I have my aisles be a little bit wider, okay, it will be less congestion. It will attract customers, and I can get more customers from Kroger down the street. So you are competing with them. And then you implement this new idea, which is to have wider aisles. Well, what's going to happen? You're going to have higher profits at first if it's a good idea. But after a while, other people are going to notice, and they're going to emulate what you've done. And this is exactly why we have societal progress is because we have a gradual ratcheting up of efficient methods of producing things that people want because people see what works and they see what doesn't work, and they emulate it, and that's competition. And that's why if you have an initial high profit, it doesn't last, and you have to keep innovating for the benefit of the consumer. But you're not guaranteed a profit. It's just because you were first. And that's the same thing with intellectual property, in in my opinion. I'd like to jump in here with a quick comment, too. You know, I I really understand what David's saying about the safety and security, because I think that's really what it all comes down to, right? People want to be secure in their livelihood, right, and know that they can make money from their products that they spend so much time and sweat equity creating, right? But, you know, there are a lot of ways to make money on things without the need for, you know, intellectual property enforced by the state. For instance, you know, you can sell advertising, you can uh, get sponsored to produce content. And we know that these things work because because people already do them. People are doing them now. Mm -hmm. Uh, The concern is um, what I hear David saying is I, I hear him saying, well, we know intellectual property works. I've been working under it for a period of time. My products are selling that way, and I make money with the current intellectual property laws, and that is good. therefore that's good for me. But you can look all over the Internet. Free Talk Live goes by the freemium model. 
So does Pork Therapy, and, my show. And, yep. and, and we get donations from listeners. Uh, people, you know, like the, uh, the 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 product. I don't know if it's donations. We have people sign up as members mm-hmm. of our. Uh, Amplifier uh, program and at amp.freetalklive.com and, <laughs> and they support and people and there's advertising listen to the ads and, and, and that people kind of thing. hire us for voiceovers and you know so it's almost like an artist who gets paid to play a concert instead of uh, just getting paid for their CD so you know there are lots of creative solutions and they're they're there in the marketplace already if you look for them because people already are functioning in this model where they're trying to find a way to make money without necessarily utilizing the copyright system. David, does that yeah, make sense? Got, you, yeah, it makes sense. I just, you know, I, I see it a little differently. I mean, in a voluntary society, there will still be little cartels or, or arbiters or groups to privately attempt the same thing. And I guess my, my intent is that I to state that I agree with not having a government involved because by nature it is aggressive. But in a, a private means, uh, I would see that, you know, it, it would would escalate. It you could. Know, I would file with a voluntary organization and say that this person, I believe, to have willfully attempted to um, deprive me of uh, or, or aggress against me. Well, David, and David, they, um, they I'm not sure that... I'm not sure that you would necessarily file. I mean, the Internet is great at showing who first produced content, you know. Uh. So, David, thanks for the call. We'll uh, discuss a little yep. bit more of this. Um, and Appreciate the call. 855-450-3733. Stefan, can you hang for one more segment? Sure. Great. Eight. Americans are losing their wealth. People are rioting in the streets. For years, the American people have ignored the assaults on our liberty. The book, In Plain Sight, The Disregarded Truth, not only reveals the truth and the deceptive tactics that have caused the decline of our liberty, but also identifies and explains how we, the American people, can restart what was once a free America. It's time to wake up, protect our liberty, and return the government back to its proper role. It's time to know the truth. Order In Plain Sight, The Disregarded Truth, today at Amazon.com. Free Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call in line, 855-450-3733. It's Mark with you. And Stephanie. Live Sunday edition of uh, Free Talk Live. Have you ever been the victim of an injustice and then decided to do nothing about it because attorneys are just too expensive? Jurisdictionary.com is a course for people who don't have attorneys. It arms you with the information on how to use the court's rules. Until you know these rules, you're fighting in the dark. It works for plaintiffs or defendants in civil or criminal matters in state or federal courts, costs less than an hour with any good attorney, and the four-CD course is so easy the average eighth grader could learn it in a weekend. Visit Jurisdictionary.com and download all the free tools they have there for you, the free legal flow chart, the free weekly tips and tactics newsletters. They've got a free legal dictionary. Watch the free videos. Then buy the course. It's Jurisdictionary.com. Remember, when you check out, to use the pull-down menu, mention uh, Free Talk Live. It's Jurisdictionary.com. Let's go back to Stefan Kinsella, Intell- uh, libertarian IP attorney. He's intellectual, too. <laughs> yeah, that's better. That's better. So, Stefan, um, Stephanie has a question regarding music. Yeah. Um, this, it's not really a question. It's just more of something that I would like to say to spark a discussion. I recently saw this documentary, Stefan, called Good Copy, Bad Copy. And what it's about is sampling in the music industry and also a genre of music called mashup, where basically they will take the artist will take small samples from many different songs. There could be like 20 to 60 different songs in, in one song, and they'll mix them all together, and they'll make a completely new song, but just using very small samples. And now... Right. You know, under current uh, laws, this is illegal, of course, but it's widely done, and the artists usually make money off of selling T-shirts and uh, gigs, and they get you know they get paid to play places, and uh, maybe even get some donations. I'm not really sure, but I just wonder if you could if you could comment on sort of the status of sampling in the music industry. Yeah. So, um, under current copyright law, can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. So. There is a difference between a recorded performing and a live performing. Okay. Um, 
So if you do a by performance of Led Zeppelin song, that's okay. But if you record it, try to tell it different. So you, right away, you hear all the distinction. But I agree completely with you that there is a lot of um, uh, prohibition against remixing and using other people's work. But of course, this is the essence of art to build upon what others have done. And mm-hmm. I, think, I mean, Shakespeare's work were based upon common plots and ideas. At the time, Stefan, uh, we're, you, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you right now. Yeah, a little bit of audio trouble. I think it's. Yeah. Uh, let, let me call. Let me. I'll call you right back. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Drop that line. You know, he was making the point that um, Shakespeare was based on uh, Thomas Lott, and mm. I, you know, I've heard this before too. Not that I know. Absolutely. But, you know, there are a lot. <laughs> there are a lot of works out there that um, you know haven't been copyrighted. You get uh, one of the reasons they've got those Baby Einstein videos that uh, play yeah. classical music is kids. because it's in the public domain. The, the classical music in the public domain. Yeah. And not, not Stephen, only... you back? Yeah, I'm, I'm back. Sorry okay, great. That. Go ahead with what yeah, you're we saying. A, we had an iPhone issue. So, so Stephanie's got a good point about remixing. And in fact, one of the uh, earlier callers, uh, it, it goes to their point, um, they talk about how you can't profit off your works, you can't control things. But on the other hand, copyright law means you're limited in what you can do. I mean, who knows what the creative landscape would look like today if people were free to remix and mash up and do things that they do right now under sort of um, the threat of lawsuit. I, I well, exactly. Saw, you know, I, I think that yeah. I think of almost everything that's done that sort of violates copyright laws, except cases of fraud, of course. Most of the stuff is a form of remixing, whether it's music or something else. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm i actually a uh, amateur botanist. I like plants. I have a lot of house plants, and I've been interested in ham- uh, hybridizing flowers, especially amaryllis flowers. But some of them are patented. They have these, like, pat- plant patents. And so if I hybridize patented plants, am I a criminal because I'm growing flowers? I mean, Right, you're stealing somebody's plant idea. It's the same as you know, remixing. And this so, is, the, the, you know, the folks that uh, protect intellectual property in their mind, and I get it. I was over there at one point relatively recently. Um, but, you know, those folks that do that, they always bemoan what the future may look like. Well, let's talk about what the, the present looks like as a result of yeah. the intellectual property and this What's monopoly missing? privilege on a particular idea. Mm. Well, we, we've been talking about copyright mostly, but patent is another terrible field. And speaking of, of this uh, plant patent issue, M- Monsanto, for example, is notorious for what they're doing. Yeah. So what will happen is they will get a patent on an asexually reproduced, you know, seed variety or something like that. And by the way, there's also gene patents on even human genes that they're getting yes. now. So do but I have to pay a royalty in- every time I express that gene? I mean, that's ridiculous. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and sometimes sometimes it's taken from a medical patient who didn't even consent. So you know, yeah. they get this weird gene from a medical patient from a cancer treatment, and then they take and patent something they learn from them. Yeah. So they have a patent on basically the, the human life that they were treating. But in, in the Monsanto case, what happens is um, some of these Monsanto patented seeds will blow through the air onto neighboring farmers' fields, yeah. and they will contaminate their crops. And they become part of the strain of the crop that they're growing. And then Monsanto will send the basically the SWAT teams out to stop them from selling their wheat or corn or grain because it contains an element of this patented plant gene because it blew through the air onto their fields. Now this is That's about so as sinister. absurd and Orwellian <laughs> as you could even imagine. Yeah. Now, how did they get the evidence that there that this gene is in the crops of the other farmers? They ha- they must have to go get a sample of their you know, sneak onto the field and get a leaf so they can genotype it or something. Well, maybe they have secret agents at the farmer's market and they're buying a piece of corn from mm. this guy and they go they could, they could go do a DNA test on it and then they sue them for patent infringement. It's crazy. It's unbelievable. It's really just another example of how this protects the big guys, you know, the huge mega corporations. And the way this came well, down for me, um, you know, what I had to come to, to confront in my mind, because I get the, uh, the the argument of utilitarianism when it comes to intellectual property. And I think that intellectual property exists because so many people agree it exists, but it doesn't exist in the way that we all agree it does. I mean, because, it, it, you know, the government, the government's a terrible agency to try to uh, to try to come up with this idea. Oh, sure. But, you know, when I think about ideas like 
uh, you know, the wheel, and we've talked about all these things, the combustion engine and old songs and things like that. If intellectual property is good, right, just, and fair today on things produced today, then it should be good, right, fair, and just for things produced, you know, two decades ago, four decades ago, two centuries ago, four centuries ago. We should be ago. paying Og for inventing the wheel in caveman times. And, right. Somebody and why don't up- we pay our parents for our genes, right? <laughs> All these things. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's it taken slavery. to absurd. You're right. Yeah. You know, and somebody came up with the... Go right ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, somebody came up with the idea of a chair. I, nobody's paying the guy for the chair idea, but they're, they're coming up with all different ways to formulate the chair. Let's have four legs. Let's have one leg with a little thing in the bottom, a bunch of wheels. Um, you know, let's make it go up and down. <laughs> uh, you know, all kinds of different things. Well, you know, we'll make this one for dentists, this one for barbers. They make all kinds of different chairs, but that chair inventing guy, he's not getting anything out of it. You know, we, we were lucky. We were born into a fairly advanced civilization that built upon the, the advances, the scientific and technical knowledge of generations before us. This is a good thing. I mean, we need to stop thinking of it as a bad thing when education and learning increases and people learn from each other. This is this is what society is about, all about. We need to live cooperative, cooperatively among each other, and we have property rules for the things that we, we can fight about. But we can all use the same ideas at the same time. So we need to spread these ideas and not try to stop them from spreading. And Absolutely. you can look on the Internet right now and you can look at people in the music industry, the you know the big music industry is on its way out. It's dying. And young bands, they are figuring out ways to distribute their music to their fans. They are living successful lives. I'll grant yeah. you that the world of the super rock star, the, the, the you know, the, the Aerosmiths, they may be, uh, you know, they're not going to be making the money that they make from residuals and that kind of thing. Yeah, but also but the- having lived in Sarasota, Florida, where these people park in the middle of the street because they don't care about parking tickets, um, and they live they live a lifestyle where they're you know drunk at two on the golf course and you know uh, busting out the windows at the uh, the caddy shack because well, they're s faced. I don't know that I'm going to miss that particular aspect of, uh, also of the music the, industry. The cost of producing music and distributing it now is so much lower because of technology. Sure. And they don't need those and also, big and, uh, and also yeah. and also books and even movies. Right, people can buy a thousand dollar camera. They can make a movie now. Yes. And, uh, l- l- let's, let's take the case of J.K. Rowling, which I mentioned earlier, and let's imagine someone who has a really – I mean, she was passionate about her – she was a welfare mother. Real quick. She was passionate Seven. about her ideas. Real well, quick. The point is J.K. Rowling could basically sell her books, and then she could she could get money for releasing the next version of the book. She could sell yeah. for the movie. Yep. She could That's make been done. lots of money being a consultant. She could have made lots of money. In, in a free world. Stefan, plug your website real quick. C4SIF.org. C4SIF.org. That's it. From filmmaker A.I. Wintermute comes the feature-length documentary, Liberty in Our Lifetime. It chronicles the real-life activists who have moved to New Hampshire as part of the Free State Project and the many ways in which they seek to live free. But he needs your help to get this important story off the ground. Visit LibertyDocumentary.com, watch the trailer, and find out how you can help bring this film to life. That's LibertyDocumentary.com. Free Talk Live. 855-450-3733. Uh, you know, we spent the last two hours talking to Stefan Kinsella about... He is uh, great. I like having him on. Very impressive. Um, and it's always nice to have him on and, and uh, clear up some of these the muddy issues of intellectual property uh, for us. But, um, you know, we take calls on anything, and you can call in at 855-450-3733. Take control of the airwaves. We've got an interesting story here from... WSBTV.com, DeKalb County, Georgia. A homeowner was held at gunpoint, and his family pet was killed in a mix-up involving a DeKalb County police call. Oh, my. When I rang the uh, garage and saw my dog lying there dead, I'm looking at the blood. I I lost it, Bobby Curry said. Around 9 p.m., a DeKalb County uh, DeKalb officer went to her home in Silva Court in response to a domestic dispute call with a possibly armed person. The officer said the family's German shepherd lunged at him, so he killed the dog. 
The recently rescued animal was uh, chained in the garage when the shooting happened. Curry's husband, Anthony, said the officer also pointed the gun at him and told him to put his hands up. Oh I said, goodness. why did you shoot my dog? He said, well, I'll blow your brains out, he said. Hold on a minute. Wow. You just killed my dog. Why do you want to blow my brains out? My hands are up. I said, oh I don't goodness. have a gun, Anthony Curry said. It's hard to stay calm in the face of losing your pet. Can you imagine? Yeah. You know, you just went through all the trouble. And you have no idea what's going on either? Of rescuing this animal. Um, you know, yeah. you've, your heart and soul's been put into it. You've got him chained in the garage. Some cop comes in. Uh, you know, the dog does what dogs do. Dogs, I mean, traditionally, dogs are supposed to be protecting your property. Yeah. This animal's got some, uh, you know, behavior issues. But he was issues. chained up in He's the chained, garage. And I mean, the cop shoots him dead right in your garage and then put, points the gun at you. Well, clearly that officer must have been feeling pretty scared of the dog. And I mean, I wouldn't blame him, but at the same time, it seems extremely rash to shoot a dog that's chained up. Well, and we're not probably, done. Okay. The yeah, story gets worse. And he threatened the homeowner, too. Sure. DeKalb police uh, sent another officer to the scene. The supervisor showed up, said it was an error made by an officer who was trying to help someone else. <sighs> Subsequent investigation determined the actual address had was looking for was uh, across the street. The first officer faces no disciplinary Can't action. Can't they read the numbers? Well, it happens, right? Mistakes are going to happen. If you, uh, you, know, if you give oh. law enforcement officers the ability to walk into people's homes uh, with impunity, then this is what's going to happen. Because people are going to have dogs. I don't dogs think anyone are... gave them that ability. I think they just took it. The, the courts <laughs> have. Know? Well, the courts yeah, I suppose. certainly defend them. There's no disciplinary action here. Um, he'll have to go before the shooting review board and face an internal investigation. But we've seen these uh, rash of yep, dog shootings. They did everything by the book. Yep, Everything's yep. fine. He was endangered, you know. <laughs> yeah. Curry said they don't like what happened, but can understand it. And you know, this oh. is where people come from in this paradigm. Oh. Um, now that I know he was deal- what he was dealing with and it was human error, I can understand why it happened. She and her husband said that the incident should serve as a lesson to officers to double-check the addresses they're responding to. You think? Yeah, I mean, you know. And what? You know, if... if I an- wouldn't feel so, the same way. Yeah. I, I'd be like, I'd be so cursing mad that I wouldn't know what to do if they came in and shot my dog. I'd be terrified. I mean, what if they shot your kid? What if they came in and, you know, police put, tend to be very raid. deferential when it comes to children. Usually when oh, children get shot, know. it's a, it's a big mistake. Um, you know, they cops tend to try very hard to protect children, but a lot of times there's a, there are a lot of stories of cops shooting dogs. Like it's almost standard operating procedure. Yes, that's true. I, and I just have to wonder though what, you know, what's behind that dog. One of the first rules of firearm safety is you always know your target and what's behind it. And if there if there's a garage, there could be a person behind it. Happens, him. sure. The dog could move, and you know, I mean, you right, never know. It just it, doesn't seem very safe. Yeah, maybe that's the the rule for safety. But you have to understand, officer safety comes beho- before everything else. That includes the homeowners and everybody yeah. else. Officer safety is paramount. Apparently, is what they it does. Say. Um, and I think that that's that, that's how they seem to operate. And you know, if you offer, officer safety was indeed paramount, you'd stop sending them into places like this. Like they own the place. He yeah. should have been knocking at the door. Yeah, that's what, what should have been the, happening. What did the article? Maybe I missed it. But what was the alleged purpose of the visit to the it, other house? It was uh, domestic violence with a possible weapon. Okay, uh, but you know, they, just a possible weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, who knows what. So, um, you know, I mean, so they go in guns a blazing with that call. That's kind of what they're, they're not really the best. You know, I always laugh when people call the cops about um, interpersonal disputes because they are always going to escalate the situation. You know, I, I really, I'm sure there are cops out there that do not escalate the situation. I'm sure there's good ones out there. But, you know, in the same way, since there if there are good ones, there must be bad ones. If there okay. are ones that are um, that, that try very hard to use their weapons in, in a manner that uh, would be you know just and right, there are ones that are itching to shoot some somebody or something. something. And those ones are looking for the opportunity to shoot somebody's dog. I mean, there have been video after video after video on the Internet. There yeah. was one where a cop had driven to the end of a dead-end road, went to get some directions from a homeowner, and shot their dog in their yard. 
Yeah, it's I mean, unbelievable. Even I, very small dogs sometimes they'll shoot. Yeah, there was a, uh, an incident with an inside a house with a corgi, um, and they wow. shot another dog that was in a crate. And in that yeah. instance, they've uh, shot cats too. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they really have. I remember the stories. About I don't. Them. I don't know. If, I can't remember a cat story off the top of my head. But I think about situations where you know when you have hard flooring in Florida, uh, it's it's common to have tile flooring when you know bullets are just flying all over the place. You're talking about picking up shrapnel, yeah. um, things going through drywall, just to pass. I mean, you know, bullet drywall is not going to stop any kind of bullets. Oh, yeah. So bullet, you know. And uh, how many times do you see some story where, you know, cops shoot at man uh, 24 times, hit him 10? I mean, right. this, it, it's, it happens all the time. You can read these. And where are those other bullets going? Yeah. I, you know, it can be very dangerous, and sending these, sending police officers into homes needs to be something only for the very worst crimes. You know, there's a convicted arsonist in there, murderer, uh, you know, bank robber or something like that. Then we're talking, but the, the vast majority, the the um, home, yeah, in, getting directions, yeah, yeah. When they go into, but in the, the getting directions, they shot the the dog in the yard, yeah. Um, Ugh. but they they go into people's homes every forty seconds. There's a SWAT raid in this country every forty seconds. Some of them are bound to have the wrong address, and the, some of them are bound to, and most of them are drug oriented. Yes, it, it's incidents where people's lives are not in danger. Yeah. Um, where they could, you know, do all kinds of other things and said instead of sending in, uh, you know, teams where you don't know what's going on, and it, you know, just creates a myriad of problems. And oh yeah, it's not going to get addressed. Not not with the way things are going. No, because when the, per- the politicians per- care what happens with with co- what cops say, not with what um, citizens say. Yeah, I mean, the current paradigm, especially with the drug war, is that you know these people need to be punished for use of drugs and. I don't think either one of us, Mark, would say that, like, you know, we support drug use or we think it's good. It's just that we we know that prohibiting it and using these um, these punishing tactics really leads to a lot more problems for all of society, you not just at- for the drug users. It's for everybody has to pay for it. Everybody is subjected to the risk of this violence from these SWAT raids gone wrong, you know, and I don't want that. You can look at uh, Portugal and Amsterdam as uh, examples of what a, uh, uh, a decriminalized drug world might look like. And crime diminishes. Uh, the the, the um, use by young people diminishes. Yep. First time use raises, meaning that uh, people you know do it at later ages. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you take away the forbidden fruit aspect, not as many people are interested. Uh, people are able to go and get treatment and... Life just looks a lot better. There's significantly less money going into uh, you know government programs trying to enforce these laws. When you look at the at this like a it's a problem, and it's a problem if the person who has that problem decides it's a problem, then you'll figure out ways to treat it and fix it as opposed to situations where you want to force other people to act the way you want them to act. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I I suppose you could do that. Right. Didn't Newt Gingrich say that uh, he thinks drug dealers should get the death penalty and I, stuff? There's a quote but out it's there. At what cost? How much are you willing to pay? How many people are you willing to kill? How much money are you willing to spend? How Wait much until it comes to your your family yeah. and one of somebody in your family? Would they be better off with a ten year prison sentence because they possessed a plant? Eight five five four five zero three seven three three. Free talk live. As a smoker, you know traditional cigarettes are unhealthy, and the taxes feed the very beast stealing your freedom to smoke. That's why the Vapor Station offers an assortment of electronic cigarette kits. Each rechargeable, refillable kit is an effective, affordable alternative to smoking. No combustion, no tar, no foul, lingering odors, and no smoke, secondhand or otherwise. Just inhale pure enjoyment and exhale vapor. Take a puff just about anywhere without getting hassled. Get your e-cigarette kit now at VaporStation.com. Free Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call in line here on the live Sunday edition of Free Talk Live with Mark. And Stephanie. 855-450-3733. The state owns the land, but they don't own the water. To be free today, you need a boat. 
not just any boat, a life yacht. It's a stable catamaran, as big as a house, that purifies its own water, generates its own power, grows its own food, and has a shallow draft to be able to get a four-wheel drive car or SUV ashore. With a life yacht, you could live free of nearly any government intrusion and have a seashore home anywhere in the world. You can be involved for $1,000 in the commitment of as little as eight months. It's ericksoncouncil.com. That's ericksoncouncil.com. And a lot of people ask me how to spell it. If you just uh, you know use one of the search engines and search Erickson Council, uh, you'll be able to uh, to find it that way too. But um, you know I, mean, I can try to spell it for you on the air. It just doesn't go that well. <laughs> so <laughs> let's go to the phones and to the fun. We've got Kelvin in Colorado calling in. Kelvin, you're on Free Talk Live. What's on your mind? Hey, good evening, Mark, uh, Stephanie, and Mandrick. <laughs> Hi, Kelvin. If you must be watching the cam at cam.freetalklive.com. Oh yeah, it's always amusing. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the uh, the uh, Liberty Forum, and so uh, many people are coming to the Liberty Forum not only to share in the camaraderie, and they're, they're also there to evaluate the area to see if they would, you know, consider moving there. For I the imagine a lot of people project. are sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've uh, you know, if we say uh, project outreach people would have some incentive to offer some sort of uh, like. Freedom tours or something before and after Liberty Forum, uh, and I I contacted them and they weren't, you know, they they responded very politely and gave me some other ideas, but said they weren't uh, interested in doing that because people generally didn't have much time before and after, and the weather is unpredictable and you know mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever. Anyway, they weren't too interested in it, and I was thinking that you know that might be a good idea for somebody that wanted to make some money or something, uh, set up some tours with some experienced uh, Liberty-type people that can help, you know, show the things that would be of interest to movers. You know, Kelvin, um, um, I think, here's a tip. I think if you contacted uh, a realtor, like, for instance, the Porcupine realtor, Mark Warden, he would probably give you a tour if you were thinking about buying some real estate. (laughs) Is that PorcupineRealtor.com? Correct, Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, and that was one of the suggestions that the Free State Project... Uh, oh, right on. The great minds think alike. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I didn't want to, you know, possibly take advantage of some, you know, somebody real estate person when I'm just sort of tentatively looking, you know, and I have them, you know, like take me around and spend much of their time. I'd be willing to pay, you know, for, for the service, but I, you know... What I would think the best thing to do would be is to talk to different people at the Liberty Forum, and I'll bet you that there there are certainly people that do all kinds of different work, and uh, you know some of it's uh, you know pickup work, things like that. And I bet you there are some people that would make good choices. Pickup work? What's that? Pickup just means you know do odd odd jobs. jobs. Oh, odd jobs. And, you know, I mean, if they're anything like me, I love to talk about the different places that might be good, um, you know, for folks to move. And sure. I attempt to be as... Uh, People are going to have agendas, though. They want you to move to their area. Everybody's got their own agenda. <laughs> but, so talk to a lot of different people and ask them that question. <laughs> right. And you just find, you've got to figure out what's important to you. Um, yep. Some people, it's living um, free and off the grid. Other people, you know, they, they, they want to grow their own food and things like that. Other people want to be near metros and, you know, just... Different folks Some people want... want to move near the political type of activism. Yep. Others want to move more towards the civilly disobedient places, I guess. I've and they're to... sort of, you know, different areas that are kind of more known for either one. Yeah, I've got to tell you, if you're going to be big into the political action, um, it's hard to make it from where we live over in the southwest corner of New Hampshire to Concord for all every single bill that might have uh, some liberty you know, aspect to it, it's it's pretty tough. So you'd probably want to live somewhere near Concord within a you know half an hour, twenty minutes uh, drive to, to Concord, so that you'd be able to to get there and be comfortable with the situation. I go maybe once or twice a year, um, which shows how rarely I get up there. Yeah, I, I'm in the uh, high tech industry, so I imagine I'd end up somewhere near uh, Nashua, Manchester, somewhere in there. That that pretty much the high tech area. They they say that there's a tech corridor there. I would suspect that um, you, you know I I would think that you would have some to... people commute to Boston too. So living yep. in Nashua would be the closest place. But I think there are lots of tech jobs in Manchester. And also, by the way, if anyone is listening to this besides Kelvin and is looking for a job, I know I, I think I've given Kelvin this specific suggestion before. But there is a group on Facebook called the FSP Job Alert. 
and I think it might even be linked on the Free State Project website or forums or something. And that jo- that group has job postings multiple times a day. Yep. It's very active, and it's got a lot of um, different jobs, every kind of job you could possibly imagine. So it might be a good idea to follow that group at uh, FSP Job Alert. Yeah, e- excellent. Uh, I, I looked into the thing of uh, working in uh, Boston and living in New Hampshire, and it, from my research, it turns out that they want to tax you. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. In, uh, I wouldn't in, recommend uh, it, but some people use that as a stepping stone. Well, you know? you've got to, and you've got to look at what works for you. Um, yeah. You know, if they're going to, you know, put in, state income tax on you and working in Boston, and I don't know what the state income tax in Massachusetts is, but say it's 3%. I used to live there, and, and it's changed since I left. I think it's probably... If you can get... Ten paid ten percent more and get taxed three percent more than it makes sense to do it if that's what well it but makes there's sense also a sales tax and you know property taxes and well you wouldn't live necessarily live there um, you would live well in, you but you might go shopping near your workplace for sure yeah I mean, you probably do some shopping for things but usually when you're going shopping near the workplace you're probably getting lunch which means you're paying um, sales tax on the food and in New Hampshire you'd pay nine percent which is actually more than you'd probably pay in most states in in Florida you would pay less than that and prepared mm-hmm. for prepared food so. You know, uh, these these things are all toss ups. Uh, you got to do what's right for you when you grow get your here. own food. Work on the internet. And one thing I've got to say though, <laughs> Kel- <in> an RV. <laughs> Kelvin, uh, people do it. Is uh, you know, don't buy. I don't. Th- I think that the best advice I can make is don't buy a house right away. I would agree with that. I rented a, a apartment. For the first year I was in New Hampshire, and then I bought a house later. Yeah, and I think that you got to know where you want to be, um, and that's uh, you know that that's the most important aspect of you know a lot of people, uh, you know, they question which city they want to be in. You need to be kind of fluid. Find which one's going to work for you. Yeah, I'd really like to try out the uh, the Seacoast area. I, I see that New Hampshire ha- has been allowed to have a tiny little piece of the Seacoast. Eight miles uh, of coastline in New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And that's probably the premium uh, uh, real estate area, too. It is, um, certainly. But, um, you know, there's a very deep water port in Portsmouth, so that uh, that eight miles is uh, a valuable eight miles. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, well, thanks a lot, and I'll uh, talk to you later. Thanks, thanks, Kelvin. Say hi to us at Liberty Forum. <laughs> yeah. I will. You can count on it. Sounds bye. good. That's right. We will be at the Liberty Forum, and you can be, too, by going to freestateproject.org slash Liberty Forum. It's coming up in a month. It? Yeah, end of next month. month. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Yes. You know, we've talked about all the speakers that are going to be there. And, you know, the speakers are intended to attract people and everything. But I think that once somebody's been there, that they're really attracted <laughs> by the atmosphere after that. I yeah, mean, you don't, absolutely. Obviously, the speakers are great and, you know, it's fun to have them. But it's as much an opportunity to show the, the libertarian luminaries, New Hampshire, as it is to come hear them speak. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, check it out. Uh, it's freestateproject.org slash Liberty Forum. Free Talk Live. Digitpress.com is your home for illustrated science fiction and adventure. Escape from Terra, Volume 2, continues the bold adventures of intrepid space pioneers as they find wealth, freedom, and a giant Elvis hit in interplanetary space. Phoenix Crumb is where Swashbuckle meets Steampunk in this offbeat space pirate saga written by L. Neil Smith and illustrated by Scott Beezer. Both books are $14.95 each and available now at BigHeadPress.com. Free Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call in line, 855-450-3733. You can call in, talk about whatever you want to talk about. That's one of the things we do here on Free Talk Live. Folks, call in, hijack the airwaves. If you're like me and you don't have time to carve out, you know, periods of time in your day to sit down with a book and read it, you know, I mean, I want all the information that's in books, and I want to be able to enjoy uh, novels, uh, new novels that come out. They're certainly my favorite authors out there, but I just don't have the time to sit down with a book anymore, at least not nearly as much as I used to. Audible.com is a leading provider of 
premium digital spoken audio information and entertainment. They've got every category of books over there and um, you know all the stuff that you want to to listen to. Looking right now at the, the front page of their website and seeing uh, you know William William Gibson's new book uh, Distrust that particular flavor um, all the necessary force by Brad Taylor, uh, American Dervish a novel by Ayad Ekkar. Um and you know like all the other all the other bestsellers are going. It looks like Regis, Regis Philbin's got a new book out. Isn't that nice? You can <laughs> go and get any <laughs> of these nice. books completely free at audiblepodcast.com slash FTL. They've got more than a hundred thousand titles over there available to you. Audiblepodcast.com slash FTL. Go get it. Go get it for free. It's fast. It's easy. It's affordable. I can do it, so it must be easy. Uh, audiblepodcast.com slash F T L. Stephanie, you've got a story from uh of cops abusing their power over in Great Britain, is that right? I do, yes. Um this is pretty pretty striking. Um from the Guardian.co.uk. The headline is Undercover Police Had Children with Activists. And uh, it's by Rob Evans and Paul Lewis. Excuse me. So uh, two, this is ri- ridiculous. Two undercover police officers secretly fathered children with political campaigners they had been sent to spy on and later disappeared completely from the lives of their offspring. Were they deep undercover? I, very deep, like, apparently. <laughs> yeah. And, and this is not funny because of how it affects the kids. Sure, I mean, sure it is. I mean, it's so horrible. Um, in both cases, uh, says well, the article. Well, to some extent, these girls decided not to marry the guys that they were sleeping with. I mean, you know. Let's, let's be sure. Well, I don't see how marriage has anything to do with it. A father a, could still leave if they were married. I mean. It's a, good, it's, it's a system that for child rearing that's worked for, you know, thousands of years. Marriage? No. Yeah, that's what it's for. Right, but marriage hasn't been around for thousands of years, has sure it? it? Has state, not state marriage. Well, not state marriage, but I mean, no. Look, look, the marriage came along, and then the state came along after it. Sure. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm sure it was a religious institution before that, right? Sure. I mean, those were the, uh, you know, to some extent. But the... people were having kids before any kind of, you know, even religious marriage existed. But they were probably had commitments to each other in that way too. Yeah, maybe. Just I mean, guessing. a child is a commitment, as far as I'm concerned. Me too. You know. Uh, and I, I, I would hesitate to kind of blame the women for, you know, having children with these men. Well, I mean, it's not all them, right? I mean, <laughs> no, it takes two people to create a baby. Sure. And the woman is, you know, unfortunately is responsible for 100 percent of the growing the baby part. Right. And uh, after the dad leaves because he's an undercover cop, <laughs> he sticks her with the These responsibility people, of raising the child indeed, as well. Indeed, he stuck her. The, um, the, you know, this is, it's unfair for them to, it, you know, it's very unprofessional for them to have uh, done such a thing, but, you know, what I'm, the only point I'm trying to make here is, is that you know, these ladies have responsibility for their actions too. Everybody's got responsibilities for their actions, and they chose to have sex they, with somebody. They do, but th- this was fraud. And not use protection. I mean, this was fraud, Mark. It is fraud. They are yep. pr- representing themselves as activists or whatever i don't know what kind of activists they were i guess we'll find out if we read on in the article but uh so right in, in both cases the children have grown up not knowing their biological fathers who they have not seen whom they have not seen in decades uh were police officers who had adopted fake identities to infiltrate activist group groups both men have concealed their true identities from the children's mothers for many years one of the spies was Bob Lambert, who has already admitted that he tricked a second woman, woman into having a long-term relationship with him as part of an intricate attempt to bolster his credibility as a committed campaigner. The second police spy followed the progress of his child and the child's mother by reading confidential police reports, which tracked the mother's political activities in life. So not only have they fathered children, but now they're also spy, you know, disappearing from the children's lives, but spying on them through confidential police reports. I mean, this is just whole different levels I mean, of wrong. S- send, <laughs> send a check if you want to keep an eye on. Uh, I mean, it's just weird. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, amazing. And I know, um, you know, I know in the UK there are a lot of these sort of laws that sort of... Uh, I've heard, I don't know how true this is. Maybe one of our listeners, if anyone's listening in the UK, knows more about this than us can uh, can fill us in. But from what I understand, there are sort of tax penalties on married couples in the UK. And there is also a lot of sub- government support, i.e. welfare for single mothers. And so, of course, it's probably the, what the cops are saying to themselves is that they're taking care of, you know, what do I need to do? 
Yeah. I mean, I think that that kind of uh, political structure does incentivize yeah. single motherhood, which may not be the best for a child growing up, right? I tend to think not. To, for a kid to have two parents is probably better than one, right? I, I, I tend to think so. I mean, I... Or more. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm of the opinion that the optimum, uh, you know, sex and uh, relationship of parents is two married um, opposite sex parents. However, I, I don't know think the, opposite sex. I think oh, I think that that's optimum. Um, I think that you know that likely what that's going to do is produce. Really, Mark, you think that every straight couple is better parents than every gay couple? I said I'm... that was optimum based on their sex. Like that's oh, that's the uh, if you it's not it doesn't hang on that issue. It's just that if you get to pick, if you're going to design the perfect family to raise a kid in this society, I think that you would probably pick a male and a female that are married together and committed and that kind of thing. However. If what if that male or that female are an alcoholic, I'll go ahead and trade out um, that uh, you know that optimum situation to uh, you know uh, same sex or whatever. I just think that there's no such wait, thing wait, as optimum. Wait, wait, though. I mean, it sounds like you're disparaging same sex couples as not good parents. Why? How? How does it sound that way? Because you said straight parents are optimum, and oh well, if they're alcoholics or something, then well, I guess I'll take to the point gay out parents. There's, there's nothing in the world is optimum, right? Like you don't get optimum. It, like yeah, everybody's got I their suppose. problems and their their, their shortcomings. Um, and I think I think that in today's culture, that you'll raise a more uh, well-rounded individual if they're raised in a, um, a heterosexual couple than you will in a homosexual couple. They'll I'm not be prepared to make a statement like that. I... weird and treated like they are weird. Oh, they'll... so it's weird to have gay parents? It's weird to it be is? gay? You don't think it is? <laughs> no! If, if, if gay people weird represent gay. fewer than, one, uh, fewer than uh, 10% of the population, then I would call that weird. It's a deviation from the norm. Well, how, I mean, how little of a, how much of a minority does something have to be to be considered, is it weird to be black? I, you know, I mean, I think in some communities, it's certainly in, in New Hampshire, it is weird to be black. I mean, I'm not saying that's something that somebody has no control over. Though. Absolutely, and they, don't they have, have any no control, control over of being it. Who, gay who, either. Who, who claimed that they had any control over it? I'm not claiming it's bad either. Well, I mean, when you say something is weird and that their kid is going to turn out weird if they have gay Ask parents. Ask a black person who has to deal um, with, you know, white folks that don't get to deal with black folks very often what it's like. They're constantly asking them, oh, well, what do black people think? How the hell should I know? What, what black people think honky i'm just one black person well, you know i yeah, mean it's a course. silly so they yes of course, they absolutely get treated that they're like they're weird, weird sounds like a judgment of them i mean it just I unusual <laughs> okay but you know i don't think there's any reason to say that I'd gay like parents are not the optimum i mean they actually i've seen studies recently that say gay parents are better than straight parents because they often have to adopt children and they want them more and they care for them more lovingly. Absolutely. I don't know. Uh, straight parents can have kids accidentally and I don't know what the sure. uh, percentage um, of them that have that kids accidentally. But 50% I think people... of all pregnancies are unintended. Right. And, and so you, you're, you're making it seem like I'm saying that every straight couple is better than every gay couple. And I'm not saying that. Okay. I'm saying you're the not optimum saying people, the optimum situation means that these people are truly optimum. And to be truly optimum, I say they need to be heterosexual. That's my opinion. I think the optimum includes gay and straight. I don't think, yeah. I, you know, I, I, we I disagree, made my Mark. Eight five five four five zero three seven three three. Free Talk Live. You know that cigarettes will kill you. You've been thinking about giving the e-cigarette a try? There is a healthier option. 22,000 times healthier. Well, listen to this offer from Vaporsmiths.com. A pack-a-day smoker will save $120 a month. So you already start being richer, feeling healthier, and smelling better. What more could you want? How about a free starter kit? Just purchase 40 cartomizers with coupon code FTL. Free shipping on orders of $60 or more. 855-2-GET-VAPOR or go to Vaporsmiths.com. Free Talk Live, 855-453. That's the SACL toll-free call in line, a live Sunday edition of Free Talk Live. 855-450-3733. 
Might be able to squeeze your call in here if you give us a call in the last few last segment here of the show, last few minutes. It's Mark. And Stephanie. Check out amp.freetalklive.com. It's a great way to support the show, and there's a few perks for amplifiers. Uh, you can um, get a, a commercial-free podcast. There's a forum on the, the BBS at bbs.freetalklive.com. And uh, we ask uh, three bucks a month, and we'll spread the you can that we'll use that money to spread the word of Free Talk Live. It doesn't go for uh, paychecks or anything like that. It's amp.freetalklive.com. Now, so Stephanie, we were uh, talking about a situation here where I guess police uh, were in Great Britain were having sex. Undercover with, yeah. police were forming relationships and fathering children with the activists that they were spying on. Mm-hmm. And I have yet to read what kind of activists they were, but I, you know, I wonder if something like this could happen here. You know, I'm sure that who's I, the bit, fed and who's their children. It has. There's been <laughs> lots of situations where uh, police have gotten very deep in with um, with the people that they're watching, and it yeah. just makes you makes you wonder. Uh, but for real quick, let's go to Darian in Rochester. Darian, you're on Free Talk Live. How are you guys? All's well. Hi, Darian. I want to talk about the medical definition of death. Okay. Do you know the medical definition of death? I think I do. Okay. I'm having a debate with a friend of mine who is involved with an organization called Free Aid. Free Aid, okay. Yes, I volunteer for Free Aid. It's fr33aid.com if people want to learn more. Is that an E on the end of that or not? Uh, No, AID. Okay, got it. Go ahead, Darian. It's a a great organization, Um, especially when what happened with the Occupy New Hampshire. Mm Mm-hmm. Free Aid was down there talking about the ways that uh, private markets get handled uh, healthcare services, and they were they were terminated. But a friend of mine wants to know what is the medical definition of death. All of death. No, what? All? what is the medical uh, definition of death? Well, um, I think I'm. I think this will be my amateur answer to this question. Because you're the medicine person here on the show. You're, um, you're in what, pre-med or something like that? I'm in medical school, but okay, medical school. I'm not a doctor yet. Um, gotcha. So, wow, that's a really good question because there there can be situations where people's like hearts can stop beating on their own. But if they can be kept on life support, you know, they could be kept alive. So are they dead? I don't know. I mean, I guess they're alive with assistance. Uh, it, technology is getting better to the point where we can kind of keep people living longer and longer in uh, more dire situations. There's also brain death, so-called. But doesn't death people only occur lose... if it's permanent? I mean, if it's not permanent, they're not dead, right? Well, there have been some cases where people will meet the medical, will be pronounced dead uh-huh. and then will be resuscitated and but, they'll be alive again. <laughs> but then the doctors were just wrong. And it's not like doctors aren't wrong. They're practicing. Mm, they're I not suppose. To... Yeah. Uh-huh. Um. So I would say it's it's lack of, wow, this is really tough. You know, Darian, I think I might have to do some more research on this to give you an accurate answer. Do you do you have any ideas on your own, or is this kind of a well, yeah, settling a bet? I, I, I do. I, okay. I, I'm kind of an arrogant asshole, or I believe that I'm right. And I believe the only way to kill somebody is deprive them of oxygen to the brain. You have situations, like somebody's on, they have an artificial heart. Uh-huh. And the the whole purpose of that artificial heart is to circulate blood in their body. The whole point of making blood move is to bring oxygen to the brain. Right. So you mentioned earlier brain death. Mm-hmm. I think when when the brain does not respond to an EKG, they are dead. Well, actually, um, as I understand it, there can be de- like electrical activity in the brain after someone is technically dead and they're never, you know, they're never going to come back to life. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that, that is ultimately the way that everybody dies, I guess, is the lack of oxygen to the brain, right? Well, can, can the a brain... brain be dead without, uh, with a heart still be beating? I mean, is that possible? Well, so there are some cases where, like, for instance, Terry Schiavo was this very famous case in the media where yeah. she was in a, um, I think, a car vegetative accident. Vegetative state? Yes, she was in a vegetative state. And what that means is that the, um, the sort of, like lower parts of her brain like that control breathing and heart rate and those kind of things were functioning so like her brain stem was working but all of her cortex or her higher functions that kind of 
define humanity, like the ability to think and speak and Mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Those were, um, were that part of her brain was like liquid mush. Mm. So, um, she had the ability to breathe, but she had no higher cortical function. So was she dead? Was she brain dead? That was the question that was being debated. Sure. Darian. So, quick question, and I, I'm actually interested because I, I love all the things you're saying, and, I'm, and Stephanie, I went back and forth. I'm wondering if I can have somebody else hop on the line. I know that might violate the sure. line policy. Pass it over. Sure. <laughs> but the, per- the person that I'm debating with, can he jump on the line? Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Are this we is waiting? entertaining. Okay. Hello? Okay. Hey, this is Ralph. Hello. All right. So what I was saying to Darian was that cause of death, medically speaking, is always about what caused the heart to fail. Mm -hmm. All right. So, you know, it may be, yeah, this guy died because somebody put 30 rounds right through his chest and that destroyed his heart. It may be that, hey, this guy fell off a building and crushed his heart. You know, any number of things. But it's always, it always comes down to the heart has failed. Yeah. And that's what the cause of death ultimately is. Uh-huh. The cause the, So if the so heart death is the is the uh, argument here death is in the brain or death is in the heart? Is that the question? No, that's well no, that's see that's that's the thing. Darian's misunderstanding. That's that's what he's trying to make it into. And, okay. and I was talking from from the aspect of when you're talking cause of death, say um you're you're filling out a report about a homicide or you're talking about a technique to kill an enemy. It always comes down to heart failure. Yeah, so, I mean, Dar- what Darian said was that, uh, I think what I understood was that he said that it's about lack of oxygen to the brain. Death is about lack of oxygen to the brain. And if your right. heart is not beating, you will not get blood circulating or get oxygen to the brain. Right. And so those things are kind of connected, right? So could you right. both be well, that's, right that's in a sense? I explained to him that, for example, what they teach now in CPR is, that, is for adults, they've gotten rid of rescue breathing. They yes. teach only chest compression. Correct. Is that so? Right. Yeah, Free Aid has actually tried to do um, a, a lot of educational outreach about CPR and how um, pretty much anyone can help in an emergency if they know somebody is in cardiac arrest. They can. Uh, there are defibrillators in a lot of places, yeah. public places. They can also try to do CPR. And now for adults, as uh, Ruff just said, they are not recommending rescue breathing, just chest compressions. Because, you know, in a lot of situations, you don't want to put your mouth on someone else's mouth. They might be covered in blood or vomit or something like that. But you can still help them by doing chest compressions. So they don't even... We were always taught 15 and 2. Yes. That uh, was, was how it was. Guys, thanks for the call. Appreciate the uh, call here on Free Talk Live. I don't know if we answered their question. <laughs> but I it sounds like a fun one get... to debate. Yeah. I mean, it really does. Well, you know, you can so, uh, you... appreciate them calling. <laughs> <laughs> debates are worth what debates are worth. So we were talking in the, the last segment about sort of the value of uh, relationships and, in, in, um, you know, the rearing of children. And I want to make clear what I'm, I'm trying to say. <laughs> Go ahead. Here. Clarify your Because all I'm talking about here is sort of a continuum of good and bad, right? Like we would we would agree that Uh um, there's no such thing as the perfect set of parents, nor would there be the perfectly evil set of parents. It's all a continuum on that line, and that everybody tries to do the best with the circumstances they have. It depends on your own values too, right? Uh, Yes. If you're judging the perfect set of parents, then they encompass all of your values, right? or they embody all of your values, but people have different values. And not all of those values are universal. I think that um, the perfect set of parents, to some extent, provide their kids with a a view on the world that allows them to assess the world as opposed to providing them with a view on the world, right? So they give them the ability to make their own decisions as opposed to telling them this is how things are. Oh, I disagree with that. A lot of parents tell their children this is how things are. I'm I'm telling you what I'm – as my value statement that uh, parents – a good set of parents would provide Uh, a kid with with a a system for – Judging what is good and bad, not um, you know, okay. just telling them them um, that uh, themselves. Sounds like something gay people can do just as well as straight people. Agreed, and I would say that um, that you know, when I'm when I say that the optimum set of parents would be heterosexual, um, in it's only saying that yes, heterosexual parents can go from you know very bad to optimum, and 
no, none of them ever reaches. But gay optimum. parents could never reach optimum. I, I have to say that um, they, that they're going to I totally disagree. Be in a situation where uh, they're going to raise kids in a situation where people want to talk to them all the time about gay parents. What? Well, tell us about these gay issues. They're well, that's never tired that's of never going to go away unless people come out of the closet and yes, raise. Yes, but kids I'm not your guinea as... pig, and I don't need to be raised by gay people so that you um, can see a better world in the future. Um, and I don't want to put a kid through it if they don't want to be through it. I think it, we can all 